So if it's too cold, you can close the windows. Uh, we would open it. Yeah, if you're fine, then we just leave it open. Yeah. Es kam ein kurzer Ping. War nicht besonders laut, aber war nicht besonders laut, aber er kam. Ja. Ja, das reduziert das. Welcome to Nonlinear Optics. What did we do last time? So the idea was, after developing or repeating some subjects of linear optics, the idea was that we would introduce nonlinear optics in a very simple way, actually. In linear optics, we described the polarization. I still have some echo here. So in linear optics, we described the origin of the refractive index, for example, by looking at the polarization. And now we introduce the nonlinear polarization. And I just show you what we wrote up uh, last time. So um, we now wrote the, um, the polarization here. Um, as, well, still the linear term, of course, but then also a term that is nonlinear in the electric field. For example, here quadratic, but also cubic, or even uh, higher orders, if you wish. So, and then we said um, for, um, that, we, that, we, that we would try it out, and we would just um, assume in a first example that we take a monochromatic field, just one frequency, and we plug it into this nonlinear polarization and see what comes out. Well, the thing that we certainly expected was that we would get frequency doubling. But what we actually also got was um, a term shown here that has actually no frequency dependence so a term that, that doesn't propagate. Yeah, so if you um, have no frequency dependence, if the wavelength is infinitely long, um, then um, this polarization here can't lead to an electromagnetic wave. Um, and, well, um, this is what we expected. So we, um, yeah, and this was just by, this was just by very simple Trigonom uh, trigonometry. And we'll see today, today uh, another instance where this comes out. But uh, you have to wait for, well, I guess um, three quarters of an hour um, in order that we come to, to that point. Um, I mentioned already that this uh, field is not so 
unimportant as it might look here. Yeah, I said it doesn't propagate, but what you can do actually um, is the following: that um, you look at the um, um, that you take well not an, a really monochromatic wave but a wave that has an envelope that is a short pulse in this, um, in this um, example. So it's a femtosecond pulse, and um, it now hits uh, here this nonlinear crystal that, um, yeah, that you might think um, is useful for frequency doubling, but what comes out is, um, is this quasi-static field that we have here um, this quasi-static field that we have here. Um, and this field here um, produces then a short, a short pulse which has an envelope that is similar to the envelope here. And therefore, if you have a pulse that is uh, 10 to 100 femtoseconds long, is a terahertz um, laser pulse. And uh, tera... Sorry? Yeah, there is some echo. This is this headphone. So maybe I just unplug it. So does it work now? Yeah, so now the echo is gone. It was a, a slightly disturbing, right, this, this echo. OK. Um, well, let's write a few things um, on, on that. Um, yeah. So we said here, the first term in contrast is not dependent on time. I wanted to write here, obviously. Yeah. And uh, therefore, there are no accelerated charges and there is no electromagnetic wave that is created. However, of course, we said already, well, if we have a short pulse, then there are these accelerated charges, but at a much, much lower um, um, frequency. Um, yeah. However, however, a static field across the crystal. Um, is created yeah. in case we have um, in case um, our uh, incident field is a short pulse The static field is not quite static. Yeah? The static field is quasi-static. Yeah? And therefore, um, charges are accelerated. Um, however, at much lower frequency. And this gives rise to terahertz pulses. There are other examples, actually, um, that um, one can, can look at. So um, another way to look at um, this problem um, is, or if you want to look at this problem um, schematically, then you can draw up the, uh, this, um, this little sketch here. So we come in with a frequency omega, and what comes out is, of course, still the frequency omega, but also um, the frequency doubled light. Um, well, this raises, of course, the question on how efficient this process can be. And we'll come to that in, 
well, not the next chapter, but uh, the chapter perhaps after that chapter, where we'll discuss the coupled wave equations for second harmonic generation. And there we will see that it's actually possible to convert or to frequency double light with close to 100% efficiency. Yeah? It's kind of, we'll see that it's kind of, um, of surprising because um, you need a strong field in order to convert, uh, in order to produce second harmonic. But now think that you have a crystal, say, of this length and you gradually convert the fundamental light into frequency doubled light. This means, of course, that the fundamental light gets weaker and weaker, but it's still strong enough in this um, coupled um, um, dynamics here is stro so strong enough that it's actually possible to convert, well, almost, or, well, in theory, actually 100% um, of the light into the second harmonic. Um, we can also look at uh, the problem um, in um, using, using um, a level diagram. So this is this one here. And you see that we start um, from our system with, um, we start from our system from the ground state, say. Typically, we start from the ground state, and then we absorb two photons to a virtual level. And we'll come to that, yeah, so that's important. Uh, it's a virtual level, um, and then um, photons with twice the frequency and also uh, twice the, f um, the photon energy are emitted. This means that the state or that the material that we have used, say the nonlinear crystal or whatever it is, that this material, the quantum state of this material remains unchanged. Yeah, we'll call this a parametric process. And we'll come to that in yeah, in a few minutes, or in an hour, uh, rather. OK, so let's also write up uh, what we said about the efficiency. Under proper conditions, and we'll have to discuss these, uh, these also, phase matching will be one of the decisive things. Under proper conditions, Second harmonic generation um, can have can have an efficiency close to one hundred percent. Yeah, and uh, if we talk about applications, yeah. So you have a question. Um, well, we'll, um, we'll see an entire zoo of, um, um, of, of, of nonlinear effects. And I'm not quite sure which uh, one you actually mean. But what's actually, um, what's actually possible is that, um, uh, and what actually takes place in a crystal, um, is that the, that the second harmonic is actually back converted into, uh, into the fundamental. So this process takes place all the time. When uh, we discuss actually about phase matching, um, if you're non-phase matched, um, yeah, so if you know about that already, um, then actually this is what happens. Yeah? So that you create the second harmonic, but if the second harmonic created in another portion of the crystal is not in phase, with the one that you previously created, then uh, this would lead to um, to what you disc uh, what you guess that should be should happen. So, um, a few examples of applications. So, applications. The 
the most important one is to, at least nowadays, uh, is to convert laser radiation that you produce with a diet laser into, into well, uh, the kind of radiation that you want. Typically, diode lasers radiate in the near infrared. Of course, there are also a few others, um, for example, blue lasers. But uh, you don't have um, diode lasers at, at every wa uh, wavelength. It has to do with properties of, um, um, of semiconductor materials. So if you, um, if you want to build a strong laser in order to pump another laser, um, then you frequently need uh, laser radiation in the visible uh, regime. A very no well-known example is, uh, are the titanium sapphire lasers. They are pumped by green light, so they absorb in the green, so you need a green laser. Informally, what people used uh, were argon iron lasers to pump a titanium sapphire laser. But argon iron lasers are very, gas lasers are very inefficient. They have an efficiency of, of a per mil or so. Yeah, so uh, when I did my, my PhD, um, then I, ha I had a 30 watt argon iron laser, which means that 30 kilowatt of electricity went into that laser. Well, and of course also, um, yeah, and 99.9% uh, .9 of that electricity or electric uh, energy was of course converted into heat. So there was also a big water tube. Yeah, and the, uh, the electricity cable was of that um, uh, diameter and it got warm. Yeah, so this is quite an impressive machine. Uh, nowadays, you, uh, everybody uses a, um, um, a diode laser for that and this is actually a frequency doubled diet laser. And the cheapest example I already, I already mentioned, this is, the, this is the laser pointer. So this is the miniature version of what, is, of, of, of what we use in the lab. So um, convert the radiation of efficient, yeah, so that's the entire um, idea that one uh, uses efficient laser or diode lasers, the radiation of the efficient diode lasers to visible um, laser radiation in order to pump to pump another laser And I mentioned the titanium sapphire laser. Yeah. Another example is that one can use these uh, second harmonic generation in order to, in order to measure something. Um, and a well-known example is the autocorrelator. Yeah. So um, uh, applications, this would be the autocorrelator. I'll draw a sketch of that for uh, measuring short pulses. Ultra short pulses. So this may look like the following. Um, we have a um, typical um, Michelson interferometer, so it looks at least like a typical Michelson interferometer. So we have a beam splitter, and we have two mirrors, and we have a detector here. Yeah. And now uh, we take our short pulse, 
and let it into this Michelson interferometer. And this means uh, that one half goes um, in either arm. So we have, we have it like this, and then it goes like this, and here, back to here. Right? Now, if both arms have exact, exactly the same lengths, yeah, so if both arms are, have exactly the same distance from the beam splitter, then, of course, both pulses would overlap here. And they would produce, at the position of the, of the detector, they would produce an interference pattern. Yeah? And now, if you move one of these, um, if you move one of these mirrors, then you can, then you can shift one of these pulses or the respective pulse back and forth. And um, if they don't overlap any longer, then there's of course no interference, right? And you could think that this is sufficient without any nonlinear optics in order to measure a pulse. Well, it turns out that this is not the case. What you actually need is a nonlinear crystal here in order to be, in order to distinguish a chirped pulse from a non-chirped pulse. Does any, uh, everybody know what a chirped pulse is? Yeah, everybody knows it. Yeah, so chirp pulse is a pulse where uh, not all frequencies come at the same time. But say the low frequency come first and the high frequency later, and then this in the acoustic regime this would uh, sound like hui, um, and you wouldn't be able to distinguish a pulse with a hui uh, from a pulse that just makes ping. Yeah. Um, so this is an autocorrelator, and one needs a nonlinear, a second harmonic crystal. Can also be a third, uh, can also be third harmonic generation, by the way, uh, but of course, second harmonic generation is more efficient than third harmonic generation. Okay, yeah. Um, of course, uh, if the pulse that comes in is not chirped. Um, then actually, so if you know that the pulse is not chirped, um, then you don't need the second harmonic, uh, second harmonic generation. But usually, uh, you use such a device just in order to find out whether it's chirped or not. Yeah? And of course, there are more sophisticated uh, versions of this, um, of this simple device than uh, what I just described. So now let's look at the uh, polarization that produces actually second harmonic generation. Yeah. So um, according to equation six. Yeah. So according to the above equation, to equation six, the nonlinear polarization without uh, optical re rectification. So we mean the polarization that produces, in fact, the second harmonic. Um, the nonlinear polarization without optical rectification is given by P2, yeah, second order polarization. Um, and uh, we have now epsilon zero times chi two times E times E, so the amplitude of the field, um, times E to the minus two I omega T plus the complex conjugate, and this time I write it explicitly. So we have E star Amplitude, complex conjugate of the of the amplitudes, and then e the exponential um, to the plus two i omega t. Yeah? 
So that's equation seven. And um, we can write this, of course, for reasons that will become uh, clearer when we discuss um, some frequency generation, which we'll do in a, in a minute. So we can write this as now a polarization that um, has the positive frequency and uh, the polarization that has the negative frequency. So we can write this as P of 2 omega um, e to the minus 2i omega t. Yeah, so I rewrote the, um, the polarization, the amplitude of the polarization actually. Um, and then we have the one that oscillates at the negative frequency. So uh, e to the plus i omega t. Yeah? And uh, it is of course clear that p of 2 omega is given by, well, uh, we have it actually here, but I just write it down explicitly. Um, we have epsilon 0 times chi 2 times the amplitude squared, and the negative part is, of course, given by the complex conjugates. So epsilon 0 times chi 2 times e star e star. So that's good enough for the time being for second harmonic generation. As I said, we'll come back to it when we establish the coupled wave equations for it and actually solve them. So the next point, so the next thing that we can do, the next complicated thing that we can actually do um, would be to use two colors and shine them on the nonlinear crystal. Yeah? And this is what we are going to do now. And this will lead to some difference frequency generation. Also two very important effect, in, in particular actually, difference frequency generation is of, yeah, of, of outstanding importance. So some, and difference frequency generation. And we call this, or abbreviated with SFG, and DFG, difference frequency generation. So, um, and as I said, we use two frequencies, so let's write them down. So instead, of a single frequency for the in incident field we use two. And this means that the electric field can be written as just the sum of both. So we have the first one. And you see uh, it has frequency omega 1. And I also call the amplitude omega 1. Uh, um, uh, I also call the, I also give the amplitude the index 1. And then we have the second one with frequency omega 2. And then we need to add the complex conjugate in order to, to produce a real field. And uh, this we just plug into, um, into, the, um, into this expression given by, well, uh, we 
Yeah, we just plug it into um, the second order polarization. Um, yeah, so we just multiply them with each other. So according to equation one, P2 is given by um, P2 of t, just the square of both. And if we multiply it out, then it gets already a little bit lengthy. So we have e1 squared e to the minus 2i omega 1t plus e2 squared e to the minus 2i omega 2t. And then mixed terms, namely 2 times e1, e2, and now e to the minus i omega 1 plus omega 2 times t. And more mixed terms. So um, two times e1 times e2 star, so which has the negative frequency. Yeah? And accordingly, in the exponential, we have now e to the omega 1 minus omega 1, I wanted to write minus omega 2 times t plus the complex conjugate. And then we still have terms that don't depend on frequency. Yeah? So what we have is epsilon 0 times chi 2 times e1 times e1 star plus the same thing for e2. Yeah? And you're easily able to, to say what is what. Right? So what we have here is frequency doubling again of the first frequency, then frequency doubling of omega 2, and then we have some frequency generation, and here we have difference frequency generation. Yeah? Now we do the same thing that uh, we did actually here. So um, I wrote these things here as, as polarizations, right? So now I can start to write a polarization here for frequency doubling of the first frequency, a polarization for frequency doubling of the second polarization, and uh, then uh, a nonlinear polarization for some frequency generation and for difference frequency generation. Let's do that. So that's actually, I need house numbers for these equations. So that's equation 10. And that's here equation 11. So we can write 11 as a sum of the polarizations. So we write the nonlinear polarization as the sum of the polarizations of all the processes that we have discussed, yeah? including uh, their negative uh, frequency parts. Yeah? And in order to be specific or to make it clear, we write the individual um, well, I could also perhaps write here an n, but it's um, obviously not necessary because the argument um, says it already. So uh, let's write them explicitly. So we have the frequency doubled, so the polarization for frequency doubling of omega 1. And this is epsilon 0 times chi 2 times e1 squared. Yeah, so this is second harmonic generation. Then um, 
or perhaps uh, write it like this p of 2 times omega 2 epsilon 0 times chi 2 and then e2 squared this is second harmonic generation then we have p of um, omega 1 plus omega 2 and this is given by 2 times epsilon 0 times chi 2 e1 times e2 that would be some frequency generation of course then we come to difference frequency generation omega 1 minus omega 2 2 times epsilon 0 times chi 2 times e1 times e2 star um, that's difference frequency generation and then we have optical rectification which is given by 2 times epsilon 0 times chi 2 and then e1 times e1 star plus e2 times e2 star optical rectification and we are not done with that it's still incomplete we have only half or pretty much half of the work um, accomplished we also have to take the negative frequencies yeah? um, and the analog thing with the negative frequencies No, and I write just uh, one or two of them. So, for example, P of minus 2 times omega 1, this would be given by epsilon 0 times chi 2 times E1 star squared. Or let's take another one, namely um, difference frequency generation. So, there we would have minus omega 1 plus omega 2. Uh, is equal to epsilon 0 times chi 2 times now e1 star times e2 yeah. and um, this gets the house number 13 and these expressions here the house number 14 and you can easily prove this by plugging it in but it's obvious anyway so one remark, um, what you see is that um, we started with two frequencies and what we get out is two times omega one, two times omega two, then the sum frequency and the difference frequency. So four different frequencies. So you could expect a very colorful experiment, but usually this will not happen. And the reason is the thing that we already briefly touched, namely phase matching. So if you are lucky enough and are able to phase match one frequency, then it's, then it's uh, not very likely that you uh, will be able to, um, to phase match another frequency, not to speak about four frequencies. Yeah? But we'll come to f uh, phase matching. Uh, phase matching later. What you basically need to do is actually that you need to make sure somehow that the refractive index for different colors is the same. Uh, and you can imagine that this is not a very easy task. You might even ask yourself, is it possible at all? Well, fortunately it is possible. And by reference, so the thing that we discussed in the first um, in the first chapter um, is one of the major uh, methods in order to achieve phase matching. So let's write this down as a remark. Um, so we create four new frequencies
from two incident frequencies. Yeah. Um, therefore, one might expect um, a very colorful experiment. Um, unfortunately, this is not the case. because of phase matching. Or rather, phase mismatch. See you later. Yeah? So let's be a little bit more specific and uh, indeed look at some frequency generation individually, and then a difference, if, a difference frequency generation. So um, some frequency generation after all, um, we might also be interested in hearing what kind of applications are possible. So the, the respective polarization is clear. It is given by P omega 1 plus omega 2. We had it already as equation 13, I guess. Uh, 2 times epsilon 0 times chi 2 times E1 times E2. Yeah, and you guess that it's quite similar to, to frequency doubling, actually. Yeah, so frequency doubling, in some sense, can be considered as, as the degenerate version of some frequency generation. Yeah? So, um, well, there are slight differences, but anyway. Um, so some frequency generation is very similar to second harmonic generation. Yeah. Um, we have omega 1 equals omega 2. Yeah. And um, well, there's a slight difference, and this slight difference is this factor two. Yeah? This is this factor two that we didn't have here for for the polarization. Yeah, so for um, for this polarization, right? Why is this the case? Well, the reason is trivial. If you want to consider frequency doubling, second harmonic generation as some frequency generation, then you would need to split your beam first, yeah, produce or at least uh, split it in your head, yeah, and, um, and, then do, and then do some frequency generation with these two beams. Yeah, so if you feel too cold, then uh, we can close the window. We just need to open it every 20 minutes. I think we missed that already. So perhaps we open all the windows for two minutes, and then we close them all. Yes? It's far more effective to, to open the windows for two minutes, and then to close them all and open them after 20 minutes again. I did a bit of, um, of modeling uh, last weekend. It's actually quite interesting to see yeah, So what you so suppose one of you is, is infected. Yeah? 
then you would produce at a constant rate virus particles. So aerosols, water particles, small uh, water particles loaded with viruses. Yeah? And they quickly distribute in the room evenly. Yeah? So uh, after a few minutes, we would have a homogeneous distribution of viruses. And, um, and then you can uh, start to calculate how much virus do you, do you breathe in. Yeah? And what you get is, of course, a quadratic curve. Yeah? Because the viruses um, increase linearly, and what you breathe in then goes, quadratic, goes up quadratically. Now, if we open the windows, and we do it well, yeah? so uh, ideal would be to even open the door, um, then, um, then we reduce the number to zero. And what we would get is, um, is a dependence of the, um, of the viruses that you breathe in like this. Yeah, so, and this is where you open the windows. Yeah? Um, otherwise, it would go up like this. Yeah? So with this, we can close the windows. We can close them all. Yeah? It is not very useful to, to leave open one window. Uh, it's more important to, to do it regularly. Every 20 minutes is a good, is a, is a, is a good interval. OK, so this just is a side remark. Um, so some frequency generation, we said, is very similar to second harmonic generation. Ah, by the way, uh, you uh, can remind me uh, if, I, if I forget it. Yeah? So uh, that would be actually a good, or I could program my, my iPhone to do it. Um, so um, some frequency generation, we said, is very similar to second harmonic generation. Yeah? So there's this factor of two, which has actually trivial reasons that I explained. Yeah. Um, so there is a factor two in fifteen that was not there in equation, what was it? Well, had no number, unfortunately. Well, give it a number, eight. Yeah, so it is good that I leave open a few house numbers. Um, that was not there in equation eight. Yeah, and the reason is trivial. Yeah. Um, in order um, to picture um, second harmonic generation as some frequency generation, one has to split the beam in, say, two equal halves. A few words on possible applications. What you might want to do is to create tunable laser light. In order to do spectroscopy, for example, you might be interested to have a fairly strong beam that's tunable. But what you only have is are two infrared lasers, say, one that's fairly intense and the other that you can tune. Yeah? And now if you make some frequency generation and are clever enough to 
um, to realize um, face matching, then you can actually do that. Yeah? So as an application, generate tunable um, say UV radiation, so short wave radiation. That's not very, not very easy to, to create a laser or to build a laser that's tunable at high photon energies, so in the UV. Um, but this here would be, would be a way. Yeah? From a strong fixed frequency, laser, yeah, say in the visible, and a weak tunable laser, say also in the visible. Now you realize, of course, that a fixed frequency laser is in general less complex than a tunable laser, and therefore it's likely that the fixed frequency laser is the strong laser and the tunable laser is, is the weak laser. Another application can be to kind of amplify a photon. So say you have, um, you have um, a, a photon in the infrared that's hard to detect with with a detector. If you have a silicon detector, then your photon energy needs to be larger than the band gap, which is 1.1 EV for silicon. And uh, if you want to detect a photon that has only um, um, photon energy of half an EV, then you could actually also do this here. Yeah? So you had a question? Uh, it's difficult to so understand. Can you tell us that it is very hard to generate second harmonic liquid in frequency uh, because of the phase matching? Yeah, well, of course, you need to uh, you need to make sure that um, that you achieve phase matching here. It's but we'll see we'll see how this works um, for for the different schemes. Okay. Yeah. So next is difference frequency generation. On first glance, difference frequency generation just looks like, well, some frequency generation with a, where one of the frequencies is negative. But this is actually, yeah, um, in mass we say um, taking the sum and the difference is the same. Yeah? Uh, but actually here there's a decisive difference. And um, difference frequency generation is actually, yeah, is actually more, uh, more interesting and more intriguing than some frequency generation, which is a little bit trivial. Um, so difference frequency generation. So first, uh, we start in the same way as we did for some frequency generation. So we write down the, uh, the polarization. Also, it's trivial. Yeah, so the respective polarization is given by P of omega 1 minus omega 2, and this equals 2 times epsilon 0 times chi 2 E1 E2 star. Yeah, and we can illustrate it uh, in the same way as we did for, for some frequency generation. 
So, um, an illustration. Yeah, this one here. Yeah, so you see two frequencies come in. Um, two frequencies plus the difference frequency comes out. But here you see on the energy level diagram, you see already the um, well, the decisive difference to some frequency generation. Let me quickly depict um, um, some frequency generation also. Um, so this is difference frequency generation. And if I would depict some frequency generation, it would look like this. We would use two photons that come in and one photon that comes out. Yeah? So this would be omega 1, omega 2, and this would be well, omega 1 plus omega 2. And uh, here for difference frequency generation, it's different. So what is the decisive difference? For some frequency generation, we destroy two photons these two photons, in order to produce a third photon. Yeah? In difference frequency generation, in contrast, we destroy just one photon in order to produce two new photons. Yeah? So we come in with these two photons, yeah? and out comes this photon but also one of the incident photons is, is doubled, is amplified. So you see already that this can work as an amplifier. And one calls this optical parametric amplif amplification. Yeah? So at a first glance, at first glance, some frequency generation and difference frequency generation look very similar. Yeah? However, in some frequency generation, we destroy two photons, omega 1 and omega 2, in order to produce one photon, omega 3. equals omega 1 plus omega 2. Yeah, so a little bit uh, sloppy language what I use here. Perhaps I should write or should say h bar omega 1 and h bar omega 2, but everybody knows here what I mean. So in contrast, in difference frequency generation, We destroy just one photon, omega 1, and produce not just one photon. Um, omega 3 equals omega 1 minus omega 2, 
but also another photon. Omega 2. Yeah? So this means the omega 2 field leaves the crystal um, stronger than it came in. And this is called optical parametric amplification. Now, don't ask me why it's called parametric. I have some guess why this is so. But uh, we'll come to that. Yeah? But for the moment, just accept it. Um, well, there are a number of important applications for that, not just building an amplifier. So downstairs in my lab, we have actually well, a device where optical parametric amplification is uh, is is done in three stages in order to produce all kinds of wavelengths of a femtosecond laser. Yeah? Actually, in order to produce um, infrared femtosecond laser radiation um, to the mid-infrared uh, uh, regime. But um, as I said, there are many other applications. And this has to do with the very fact that we discussed here, namely, that one photon creates two photons, which means that these two photons, they, they have some relationship. Yeah? So in quantum mechanics, we say they are entangled. So um, this, it's, the process is also, um, also uh, yeah, referred to as, as, um, as down conversion. Yeah, so what we do is that we produce two photons that are entangled. And, this, uh, and therefore, this is one of the processes with which you can do fundamental experiments in, uh, in quantum mechanics. For example, the einstein podolsky rosen uh, um, uh, paradox. Yeah, so these uh, experiments are typically done with such uh, photon sources. or um, other, um, well, actually, this parametric down conversion, difference frequency generation, this was the starting point um, of, of modern quantum optics in a certain sense. So that quantum optics, um, that quantum op uh, optics evolved into quantum information, quantum cryptography, quantum computing, um, this all has to do uh, or, well, was at least to uh, a large part initiated by pioneering experiments 30 years or so um, ago. In, and they all were based on difference frequency generation. Yeah? So there, there are a number of famous experiments um, where the fact that you produce two entangled photons um, was taken advantage of. So other applications. Um, so the production of entangled photons for for example, fundamental experiments on the interpretation of quantum mechanics. On, well, I write on the philosophy 
of quantum mechanics. Are there hidden variables? These questions. Yeah. Then uh, more applied things like quantum cryptography and quantum computing. Of course, there are many more. Uh, yeah, so uh, difference frequency generation is just a small um, part, maybe just a starting point for quantum computing. Yeah, so this is uh, this is much more involved. So we have now second harmonic generation, difference frequency generation, um, some frequency generation. Now it's time to go to third order processes. Yeah? So to take the next, um, the next term here in this expansion, the next term in, ooh, in this expansion here. Right? So we look at this term here. And this means, of course, that in general we can mix three colors, three frequencies, in order to produce a fourth one. But we'll start with the simple case, namely that we just shine in one frequency and look what happens. And what happens is interesting enough, as you will see. So 2.4 third order nonlinear optical processes. So um, we consider, of course, The third term, we consider the third term of equation one, and this is third order polarization, and this is given by epsilon zero times chi three times. E times the electric field Q. Yeah, very good. Open the window for a few minutes. Yeah, well, um, as I mentioned already, um, this allows three colors to be mixed to a fourth color. Now you could, of course, also ask, and actually you could have asked this before, what if I shine four colors or five colors or many more colors into that crystal. Well, uh, what happens is, of course, that the crystal will take three of these in order to produce a fourth one. Yeah? So any combination, any three combination of the colors that you shine in can be combined, uh, can be combined to a fourth one. You may ask, well, this is, very, uh, this is a very academic discussion. Because, after all, it is complicated enough to shine in two fields or three fields. Why should I shine in a dozen fields? Well, this happens um, earlier or more frequently uh, than you might imagine. So if you have a femtosecond laser, then uh, what a femtosecond laser does is that it emits a regular sequence of, of pulses. And now if you take the Fourier transform, then you see that you have many frequencies. You have a frequency comp. And now if you shine this frequency comp on a nonlinear crystal, well, you mix hundreds or thousands of, um, of frequencies. 
Whether this is efficient or whether they are face matched or not, this is still another question. Yeah? So with this, we close the windows again. Well, if you speak of uh, the bandwidth of a laser, then you already assume that you have kind of short pulses. Yeah, so of course, uh, you can also have um, you can also have a, a single shot laser that produces a femtosecond pulse. Yeah? And um, then you can look at this um, continuously. Of course. Yeah? So um, the third power of E allows for the interaction of three colors to generate a fourth one. No, in the most general case. And this is the reason why people speak of four wave mixing. Yeah? So you combine three colors to produce a fourth one. But of course, there will be back action of the fourth color to the three others. Yeah? Um, four wave mixing. But we will start with the sing simple thing, namely, um, the simplest case with just one frequency. So the simplest case is omega equals omega 1 equal omega 2 equal omega 3. Right? So a monochromatic incident field. Yeah, then we can write the electric field. And now I write it actually as real numbers. Yeah, so I said when I use script E, then I mean explicitly that this is a real number. Of course, this is here also real. Yeah, but script means explicitly a real number. A few house numbers here. So that's equation 21 here. Yeah. And now we plug in 21 into 20, and we just look what comes out. So uh, 21 in 20. And the other thing that I need to tell is a trigonometric identity that you can look up in, your, uh, in, a, in a book or on the internet nowadays, Wikipedia, for example. Yeah. So, and use the trigonometric identity the cube of cosine omega t is equal to a quarter of the cosine of 3 omega t plus 3 quarters of the cosine of omega t. Yeah? And this means that P3, yeah, so the third order polarization is given by 
a quarter epsilon zero times chi three, the amplitude cube, and then cosine of three omega t plus three quarters epsilon zero times chi three. Um, intensity, uh, no, electric field cube times the cosine of omega t. So, now it gets interesting. Well, the obvious part is this here. What is this? That's trivial, right? That's third, um, the third harmonic generation. Yeah, so third harmonic generation THG, third harmonic generation. Well, the question is, the interesting question is what this is. Has anybody an idea what this will do? I didn't quite understand what you said. Yeah, so this is, this is a polarization that oscillates at uh, the frequency of the fundamental. But what is the consequence of that? If any, I didn't understand it. Mm, no, it's more. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I uh, understood you correctly. But think of uh, back to chapter one. This was one of the reasons why I did it. This chapter one, we discussed about the origin of the refractive index. Yeah? And there I said, what happens, or what creates the refractive index is that light incident on a piece of glass produces polarization there. And this polarization creates um, an electromagnetic wave that has the same frequency than the incident wave is just a little bit phase shifted. And therefore, the field that comes out of the piece, piece of glass is phase shifted with respect to the situation where this piece of glass is not there. So and now we see that just because of this stupid trigonometric identity, we see here a polarization at the frequency of the incident field which means that there is a contribution to the refractive index that depends actually on the field strengths. Yeah? So what we see is that we create here an intensity dependent refractive index. And this intensity dependent refractive index has a lot of consequences. Now it's a very important uh, effect yeah, and comes out just of this trigonometric identity. Isn't this remarkable? Yeah, so how simple things are. Well, in order to calculate the details, in order to calculate, well, um, how the field is, what the dynamics of the field is, uh, this is an entire different story, right? But what we see already, what we can predict here already, is that there should be an intensity-dependent refractive index. So um, this is what follows from this part is an intensity-dependent refractive index.
So before we look a little bit more at this intensity dependent refractive index, we um, consider first third harmonic generation. Yeah? And we do the same sketch that we did um, before for the other processes that we had. I thought I prepared one, but I didn't. Anyway, it's easy enough. So we have this third, this nonlinear medium, medium um, third order nonlinear medium. We come in here with frequency omega, and we get frequency omega out, but also three omega. Right? And on a level diagram, it looks like this. So we destroy here three photons in order to produce one at three times the frequency. But now to the interesting part, which is the second term yeah, that creates the intensity dependent refractive index. Of course, there are also applications for the third harmonic, yeah? no question about that. Um, I don't want to um, give the impression that it's not important, but more interesting is certainly the one that oscillates at the incident frequency. Yeah? Um, so, Um, yeah, the second term of equation 22 um, creates a polarization that oscillates at the fundamental frequency, at the incident frequency omega, just like the polarization um, created in linear optics. See chapter one. Yeah. The polarization in linear optics is responsible for the refractive index and this leads to the conjecture, conjecture um, the second term of equation I think it was 22, yeah creates um, creates an intensity dependent um, refractive index. Yep. Um, and what we'll see is the following. We will see in a later chapter yeah, that N can be written as the ordinary refractive index plus N two times 
the intensity where N2 is given by 3 over 2 times the regular refractive index times epsilon 0 times C times third order susceptibility and the intensity as usual is given by one half times refractive index times epsilon zero times C e squared. Yeah? And the consequences are profound. Namely, there is self-focusing. And there is self-phase modulation. Uh, and towards the end of this course, we'll discuss them yeah, in fairly detail. But let me first uh, show a few examples why this is important. Um, yeah, so the question is, what is self-phase modulation? Yeah. I'll explain it in a uh, in a second. Yeah. So let me explain it. So we take a regular piece of glass. Yeah. And then we use a regular laser beam. Yeah. So a laser beam that has, say, a Gaussian intensity profile, something like this. Right. Then we see that the refractive index here is larger than it is here. Right. And now you think about Fermat's principle and how a lens works based on Fermat's principle and you see that this beam will self-focus. And one can observe that and there's a famous picture for that. I hope uh, it was copied to my to the iPad. Yes, it is here. Right. So what people did here, you may recognize this building. Does anybody recognize this building here? Yeah, so this was ta uh, taken from the um, from the uh, um, light court uh, inside this building, and they used the Yeti laser the old Yeti laser and shot it into the air. Um, this was actually in 2003 um, and uh, it's a photo published in Science in 2003. Um, and uh, yeah, due to self-focusing and a few other processes you can produce a filament that's hundreds of meter long. Yeah, so they certainly had to ask air control before they did this experiment. Um, so this is one uh, example um, for an application. The other is how um, a femtosecond laser works, a modern femtosecond laser works. And um, for this I have another figure here. So what's depicted here is um, a femtosecond laser, say, right? And um, so it's a cavity. Yeah? So you have a high reflector. You have a high reflector here, right? You have the output coupler here. Out of the output coupler comes the laser beam, and you pump this laser with a green laser. Okay. Yeah. And you pump this laser with a um, with a green laser, typically nowadays um, a frequency double diode laser. Yeah? And you pump here the, the sapphire crystal. And, um, what, and these two mirrors are actually curved. Yeah? This is actually necessary in order to make a stable cavity. So a, a cavity where the beams that are 
paraxial enough where they stay trapped. So, and what you do now is that you make this cavity, yeah, that you displace these mirrors such that the cavity is at the edge of being stable. Yeah, so that it's, that it's almost unstable. Yeah? And if you do this, then this laser will be very sensitive on vibrations, um, air turbulence and everything. Yeah? So when you do this, the laser light that comes out will flicker. However, if this laser would produce short pulses, yeah, then uh, the intensity would be very high. Yeah? And then, yeah, so you focus here into this crystal because these are curved mirrors, um, then this crystal would act like a slight lens. Yeah? And suddenly the laser cavity becomes stable because of this induced lens. Right? And therefore, such a laser likes to produce pulses. Right? And actually, yeah, so this is called car lens mode locking because um, this, um, uh, it's called the optical car effect, what we were discussing. Yeah? So it's just a technical term for that. Yeah? So what happens here is self focusing inside this crystal. Actually, also self-phase modulation happens there, but this is not the point. It, um, so this is for now too, um, yeah, too complicated to explain, uh, but this one is easy enough. When this was discovered, this is approximately 30 years ago, this was discovered. I think even a little bit less than 30 years ago. People were actually surprised to see this. They didn't expect this effect. And initially, this was called magic mode locking because they didn't understand it. Yeah? And after a few months or years, it was understood, and now it's called carol lens mode locking. Yeah? So this self-focusing, uh, let's write it up. Yeah? So uh, magic mode locking. It's now the old-fashioned term for that, or Carolens mode locking. Well, and then we have self-phase modulation. Self-phase modulation is pretty much the same thing of self-focusing just in time domain, yeah? at least in a certain sense. Yeah? So what happens is um, you have this piece of glass, and there is a laser pulse incident on, on this piece of glass. And then what happens is that the refractive index in this piece of glass changes as the pulse goes by. Yeah, so in the beginning, at the beginning, uh, in the beginning of the pulse, uh, there is no change of the refractive index, but here the change is maximum. Right? And this means that instantaneously or virtually instantaneously, the optical pass length changes and this leads to the fact that the phase changes. Yeah, so the pulse changes its own phase. And what this means, we'll come to that later in the course. What this means is that new colors are created. Yeah? And um, such experiments are actually spectacular. Yeah? So if you take um, a sufficiently strong pulse and you shine it on a piece of glass, then you can get out from a barely visible laser beam, yeah, barely visible because it may be in the near infrared, such that you can hardly see it, you may get out all colors of the rainbow. Yeah? And if you visit once my lab, I hope at some point this is possible. Um, to, yeah, so once corona is uh, better under control, I hope that this is possible, then you can actually watch this live. 
with this, I thank you for your attention and see you next Monday again.